This lecture is a brief discussion on Greek sculpture during the classical transitional period. Now, what we have here on the screen is we have a comparison. On the top, we have an image that is um, a sculpture in the archaic style. And directly below, we have the later classical transitional style. The archaic style was the third sculptural style produced in Greece, and the classical transitional style was the fourth. Now this is a really great comparison because here we have two sculptures that appear to be exactly the same. It's the same subject matter presented in the same way. Both sculptures have the same content and they have the same context. The only difference that we see is style. And so it's very easy to discern stylistic differences in what otherwise is a level of similarity. Now what happened was there was this, this, this structure that was called the Aphaya. And when the Aphaya was initially built, it was during the Archaic period. And so the sculptures that were seen on the pediment and the frieze were in the Archaic style. Now, approximately 20 years later, there was a fire that damaged much of the sculpture that was located on the Aphaya. And they decided to recreate the sculptures. But what happened is within that 20 year period, Greece had shifted to the classical transitional style. So when they made those revisions, they um, basically revise them within the new style, which explains why we have the similarities, yet the difference within style. Now, at this point, we're familiar with the archaic period. And we see that this sculpture here has a lot of the features that are common within this style. We see the braided hair. We see the archaic smile. We see the stiffness. And we see the frontal positioning. Now, we can also see with these sculptural features some of the problems that are inherent within the archaic style. And I personally think one of the biggest issues that we have here is the presence of the smile. Because when we see the smile, we read it and understand it as express, expressing a, you know, a, a positive emotion. And that really is kind of at odds with the fact that he has an arrow coming out of his chest and he's in the process of dying. It's really hard to identify with and understand this sculpture on an emotional level when you have the smile. Now you might be wondering, well, why have the smile if this doesn't make sense with the, the subject matter? Is this because the Greeks were perpetually happy people? They're just always shown smiling even when they are in the midst of a painful death. The reason why we have the smile is the smile is meant to indicate life, that the figure is living. It's not meant to indicate happiness. And so we see here that this figure is still alive, even though he has been wounded and will not be alive for much longer. The other problem that we have with this sculpture is with the sense of stiffness, because it makes this figure look as though he's sort of effortly propped up on one arm, just kind of sitting there with the arrow coming out of his chest. It doesn't really indicate any sort of uh, physical struggle to remain upright, nor does the body communicate any sense of physical pain or any other sort of reaction to uh, what's happening. And so there's a lot lost here with this uh, very particular archaic style. Now we can see that there are some gains that most certainly have been made in this subsequent style. Uh, first of all, we do have the braids gone and we do have the archaic smile gone. The body is treated in a much more complex manner and therefore more realistic. Our bodies are inherently complicated. We move and we bend and we twist. We don't just sit facing forward and stiff all the time. And so when you see stiffness and frontal positioning, it's not very realistic. It's not true to the way our body normally positions itself. Now this complexity here, this is much more realistic. This looks like someone who is dying. You see that he uses his shield to kind of prop himself up with a flexed uh, bicep here to indicate that physical struggle. We have the torso twisting so that the arm can come over here and prop the, the man up further. And uh, then we have the legs that kind of extend out. And so we see, when you look at the body, you see physical struggle, that there is an effort that this person is making to use their waning strength as a way to remain upright. What a fantastic sculpture. But we're not quite there yet. There is one thing that's missing, one thing 
that the Greeks did not quite get to, that you are going to have to patiently wait until the Hellenistic lecture to see in full effect, and that is the expression of emotion. We really do not see emotion yet in classical transitional sculptures. And this is a little bit of a problem because one of the things about people is that we are inherently emotional. Emotions guide the ways that we experience life. Emotions guide the relationships and interactions that we have with other people. And very often we need emotion, um, or at least need to recognize emotion, as a means to understanding a situation. And so this actually, it's a pretty blank face. It's not really like grimacing or like crying or anything that you need to kind of look at to get an idea that this guy is dying. So the body, super fantastic representation in a realistic way, but the lack of emotion shows there's just this one little spot within the classical transitional style that needs a little bit of improving upon. And as I said, they will, sculptors will get to this place when they get to the Hellenistic period. Let's look at more examples. So this is another great comparison. Uh, it's a pretty similar situation here of a young nude male from the archaic period. And then we have our Kretos boy from the classical transitional period. Now, again, we'll notice that typical archaic features are no longer present in the classical transitional style. We no longer have the braided hair. And even though we don't have the smile here, we don't have it here. No more archaic smile. Now again, in our archaic Koros figure, he is frontal, every single thing faces to the front, and he is stiff. Now here we do not have the same. Well, we do have the frontal positioning, but we do not have the stiffness. And what relieves the Kretos boy of his stiffness is the fact that he is standing in contrapposto stance. And I like to define contrapposto stance as poking forward knee. And so you can see a little bit of a change here. The archaic Koros figure steps forward with knee locked. This figure is not stepping forward. He's actually standing still, but the um, left leg, no, so that's the right leg, sorry. Yeah, the right leg is relaxed and the knee pokes forward. And I'm going to explain how this affects the body more particularly when we get to the next slide. But I just want you to see the differences. I'd also like for you to notice um, the difference in the treatment of musculature, where here um, these muscles, which I don't know what they're called, are just like lines carved in. And here it's like a dip in the flesh to suggest the hip bone, the muscles, here we have much more of a realistic depiction of musculature than just simply lines sort of carved in. The head slightly tilts, angles uh, away. Uh, the, the inlay, the lack of inlay, makes it difficult to know if this sculpture was maintaining eye contact with us. And then we have more of a realistic representation of hair. Now this, this is the stuff. This is Doriferous by the artist Polyclitus. This probably is the best known example of classical transitional sculpture. And this is one great work of art. Now let's talk first off about what we're looking at here. We are looking at a spear bearer. And a spear bearer is an athlete. Athletes are a very common subject matter in Greek art. We see uh, athletes. We also very commonly see warriors, alive or wounded, and we also commonly see depictions of gods. And there are a couple other sculptural types we see in here and there, but these three really are the most common, um, I guess maybe categories or subject matter types that we see produced in Greece. And this is throughout Greece. This is not specific only to the classical transitional period. So Polyclitus has chosen to work with a well-known subject, the athlete. Now, prior to creating Doriferous, Polyclitus worked on a work of literature, a treatise known as the Canon. Here's her spelling here. And the Canon was a working out of the ideal male form. And when I say ideal, I mean perfect. What does the perfect ideal male look like? And one of the things that indicates perfection in early art is math. And so math was applied to 
the form, particularly the proportions of form, as a way to determine what the perfect male would look like what his body would look like. Now, of course, this is fictional. We are not perfect. Our bodies are irregular and asymmetrical. And we certainly are not um, conforming to mathematical perfection when we look at the way that our bodies are proportioned. So this is definitely an idealizing treatment of form. So he worked out all of these, these numbers and a couple of examples, and you don't need to know these uh, for an exam, but just to give you an idea, he talked about in the canon how the fact that a perfect man's shoulders would be um, one-fourth his total height, and that his head would be one-eighth his total height, and then so on and so forth. Now, after he wrote the canon, what he did is he created Deriferous as a way to put many of the uh, proportional uh, ratios that he sets up in the canon to put them in image in sculpture. And so much of the canon's principles are actually uh, addressed visually in this very incredible sculpture. Now, this is a better maybe example of contrapositive stance looking at a sculpture that actually has two legs. You can see the uh, poking forward knee. Now importantly, what the poking forward knee does, the contrapositive stance, is creates what is known as the weight shift principle. The weight shift principle. And basically the argument is that by standing in this casual stance, it activates all of the body, shifting the weight so that the body naturally balances itself. And so with the poking forward of the knee, this knee flex, the hips angle, the torso angles, and the shoulders shift as well. And actually it creates these oppositional diagonal lines, implied diagonal lines, here, 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 here. And those oppositional diagonal lines create this sense of balance. And this is appropriate because when you think about playing sports, there is a certain level of balance and uh, sort of physical ability that goes into that. And so you could certainly argue and interpret that the balance is meant to underscore notions of uh, exemplary athletic performance. Now it's not just though an idealized treatment of the body, we also have an idealized treatment of the personality of the spear bearer as well. You can see that he, uh, his head angles away slightly. We don't have the eyes painted any longer, but we could imagine that they're painted in a way that they subtly avert the gaze of the viewer. And this is meant to be a representation of modesty, that he doesn't look directly at the, at the viewer. And so the idea is, is that um, the ideal at even though he's super amazing at, um, at sports, he's got a super great perfect body, that despite these uh, attributes he remains modest in front of others and more importantly he remains modest in front of the gods. And just really quick to point out before we move on, blank face. Now I don't have too too much to say about this because I'm hoping that by this point looking at our fourth example of classical, classical transitional sculpture, they're kind of getting the, the gist of what the style is all about. But um, I just do want to say a couple things about this sculpture in general that make it really noteworthy. What we see here is an example on the part of the Greek sculptor to try to capture motion, a captured motion within sculpture. And this really is one of the first sculptures to really ever try to do this, to capture um, you know, a stopping of motion through sculptural form. And it's a very exciting sculpture, if I say so myself, in that we have the disc thrower and he, um, Myron the artist, has chosen to show this sculpture at the very most exciting moment. And so um, the disc thrower is about to throw the disc. His torso is twisted, as twisted as it can get. And it's like a spring that is coiled up. And there's this anticipation of energy and tension that you can see embedded within the musculature of the figure. The fluxing of the muscles as he turns and his body reaches the maximum amount of physical exertion that it can achieve before he throws the disc. And it also, you know, is very compelling. What's going to happen? Will he throw the disc far? Will he win the competition? This really is a very engaging sculpture. 
beautiful to show you know all of this idealized musculature our very uh, common subject matter of the athlete everything is great and amazing but there is one thing that's missing and it's the same thing that's missing in most all other classical transitional sculptures and that would be the lack of emotion we have this person who is um, sort of at the maximum of physical exertion but yet you don't see any of that strain in the face you don't see a grimace or you know anything that's indicating that he is um, in the middle of a strenuous physical task so super fantastic sculptures but just not quite there with the emotion and just one more sculpture for us to look at Aphrodite and this also is a very noteworthy sculpture because this is the first known Greek sculpture that depicts a female nude so it has that accolade all to itself and actually it made the sculpture very famous and people were really wanting to see it it had a very um, widespread reputation and it actually became like a tourist attraction where people through in Greece would come far and wide to take a look at this sculpture that depicted a nude female form now this is an important sculpture because it does communicate some of the ideas about femininity in the uh, ancient Greek period basically ideas about how the ideal woman should conduct herself so we're looking at a specific moment in time in the narrative of the goddess Aphrodite what's happened was she was bathing and she was getting out of the the bath uh, she's bathing in a public place a lake and so she's getting out of the lake and um, she senses that somebody is watching her and so she uh, before she lost her arm she was making this gesture to kind of quickly conceal her body and she had um, you know one hand that was grabbing the the uh, drapery and then the other hand that was shielding the, the genitalia and this is known as Venus Pudica this motif and it's um, basically a woman in the attempt at being on, uh, modest and so she's covering herself up the modesty also is seen here she's looking away she's completely averting the viewers gaze as though she's embarrassed or um, not really wanting there to be an acknowledgement that she's been seen in the nude and so interestingly this communicates the ideal female the masculine ideal that we saw with polyclysis deriferous is talking about the the male who's um, you know modest in front of the gods not wanting to show off his physical prowess whereas modesty for females is more along the lines of um, a sexual modesty uh, covering up the body and uh, not directly interacting with the viewer